Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where we bring you the best of the worst every Monday. Today it's not a controversial statement to say that magic isn't real, but there are always those that believe in the strange and extraordinary, even when faced with overwhelming evidence. Throughout history, some have claimed the ability to converse with the dead. Believers in the dark arts pay them dearly, hoping to speak to loved ones who have passed away, and considering the mountain of evidence that magic isn't real, the entire transaction is arguably fraud. Today we bring you the story of how witchcraft laws in England were used to stop a woman who claimed to speak with the dead. Witchcraft in England The idea of a witch didn't really appear until the Middle Ages in Europe, but most cultures have had legends about people that use sorcery. The earliest accounts appear in writings as far back as 923 BC. A witch was different from magic users in the distant past. In the ancient world, those who practiced sorcery received their gifts from other entities. Spirits might give them powers, or gods might bestow them with special abilities. A witch was an individual with the ability to use magic. The power belonged to the person, and usually wasn't being channeled through another entity. In extreme cases, a deal with Satan could be the source of magic abilities. In most of Europe, witchcraft became illegal as the Roman Empire began to crumble. But unless the witch harmed another person, usually the punishment involved fines. Only the most severe cases resulted in death. Starting in the 1400s, attitudes on the European continent began to change. Witchcraft was seen as a tool of Satan. Those who practiced it were therefore evil and had to be dealt with in the harshest manner possible. Instead of paying fines as they had in the past, suspected witches were now hunted and killed. England was slow to adopt this practice, but throughout the 1500s laws began to change to match other European countries more closely. The Witchcraft Act of 1563 stated that anyone who used magic to kill would face the death penalty. In 1604 this was expanded to also include anybody who made a deal with Satan. Between the 1400s and 1700s, suspected witches were killed in all parts of Europe. Some were burned alive, some were drowned, others were hanged. But the bloodlust continued for nearly three centuries. Modern estimates think the total number of victims in Europe was between 60,000 to 80,000. For England, the number was closer to 2,000. Most of the victims were poor women. Some were widows, and others were married to agricultural laborers. Almost all of them were known to be argumentative. Many who were killed likely did nothing more than irritate their peers. As the 1700s progressed, people started to become more enlightened. Those who were well-educated no longer believed that magic was real. The elite members of society wanted to reduce superstition among the populace and stop the barbaric practice of killing witches. The Witchcraft Act of 1735 officially ended punishment for witches. It stated that if a person claimed to have magical powers or accused another of having magical powers, then a crime had been committed. Those who violated the act could be sentenced to a year in prison. As far as the law was concerned, magic was not real. Neither were witches. Spiritualism New York was fertile ground for new religions during the early 1800s. Joseph Smith created the Mormon religion there in the 1830s. Another belief system that emerged was Millerism, created by William Miller. It is mostly forgotten today since it predicted the second coming of Christ would be in either 1843 or 1844. A third religion that sprung forth at the time was spiritualism. Believers of this religion thought that spirits were real and that the living could communicate with them. Spiritualists who claimed to communicate with the dead usually did so by entering a trance. 
Supposedly, they were hypnotized, which in turn opened their minds to interacting with supernatural phenomena. This was often done in a dark room with paying spectators. The event became known as a seance. Spiritualism and its practitioners adopted a declaration of principles. Some of those items were, We believe in infinite intelligence. We believe that the phenomena of nature, both physical and spiritual, are the expression of infinite intelligence. We affirm that a correct understanding of such expression and living in accordance therewith constitute true religion. We affirm that the existence and personal identity of the individual continue after the change called death. We affirm that communication with the so-called dead is a fact, scientifically proven by the phenomena of spiritualism. The members of this belief system who claimed to communicate with the deceased could be quite convincing. Their craft became especially profitable during times of war, disease, and famine. Numerous scientists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries investigated the claims of spiritualists. Several became convinced that ghosts were real. The press also helped spread the message. They would publish stories about seances uncritically. Although spiritualism began in the United States, by the early 1900s it had spread all over England. It was mostly popular with middle-class women, and the seances usually took place in private homes. Starting in the 1920s, a new generation of researchers began attending seances. Unlike scientists who were converted a few years earlier, these academics demonstrated that ghosts were fake. The spiritualists who claimed to speak to the dead employed several tricks to convince the audience. Stage props, fake noises, and optical illusions were all used to satisfy paying customers. Most of the so-called psychics were ignored by authorities, but one woman would convince the government that her version of spiritualism was dangerous. Helen Duncan Helen was born in Scotland in 1897. As a young child, Helen believed that she had clairvoyant powers. She would make predictions about horrible things that would happen in the future. Helen shared the premonitions with the other students at school, which most found upsetting. She would also behave strangely at times, claiming that spirits occupied her body. Helen's family was Presbyterian and were not amused by her belief in the supernatural. They were most likely relieved in 1916 when Helen married Henry Duncan and moved out of the family home. He supported her paranormal habits, unlike Helen's parents. In 1926, her supernatural abilities evolved. She claimed that the spirits of the recently deceased could emerge into our reality. Helen could make this happen by discharging ectoplasm from her mouth. Spiritualists believed that ectoplasm was a physical manifestation of spiritual power. Helen also claimed help from a spirit guide named Peggy, who only appeared during seances. In 1928, a photographer decided to attend one of Helen's demonstrations. The pictures he took showed that Helen's guide was nothing more than a doll, simply a mask placed on an old sheet. Although pictures showed that Helen was clearly not speaking with the dead, she persisted in holding seances and grieving people continued to attend in hopes of hearing from deceased loved ones. Harry Price was a British author and a psychic researcher who used the tools of science to investigate the paranormal. Helen Duncan intrigued Harry. He wanted to learn more about how she was communicating with these spirits. Harry was able to get a sample of Helen's ectoplasm. When a chemist examined the supernatural material, it turned out to be cheesecloth covered with egg white and a few other chemicals. In 1931, Harry paid Helen to perform several seances. In return, Harry was allowed to collect samples and observe. But Helen wasn't always compliant. Harry Price noted the following when he tried to x-ray Helen. At the conclusion of the fourth seance, we led the medium to a settee and called for the apparatus. At the sight of it, the lady promptly went into a trance. She recovered, but 
refused to be x-rayed. Her husband went up to her and told her it was painless. She jumped up and gave him a smashing blow on the face, which sent him reeling. Then she went for Dr. William Brown, who was present. He dodged the blow. Mrs. Duncan, without the slightest warning, dashed out into the street, had an attack of hysteria, and began to tear her seance garment to pieces. She clutched the railings and screamed and screamed. Her husband tried to pacify her. It was useless. Eventually, Harry published a report. His observations indicated that Helen was not really speaking to the dead. A former maid of Helen's also confessed to helping her with the illusions. And eventually her husband admitted that the ectoplasm was something she regurgitated during seances. Despite all the evidence that Helen did not possess paranormal abilities, she continued to hold seances. Hopeful people that believed in ghosts kept attending. HMS Barham Although Helen was committing fraud, the authorities mostly ignored her, but the courts in Edinburgh, Scotland finally punished her in 1933. During one seance, supposedly the spirit of a young girl appeared. The room was dark, and the ghost seemed to materialize in front of the observers. One of those attending the event jumped up and grabbed the spirit. It wasn't a ghost. Helen had put a mask on a vest, then used it to fool observers. The police were called and it took Helen into custody. She was tried for being a fraudulent medium and was fined, but the experience did nothing to stop Helen from practicing her craft. As World War II progressed, Helen stayed busy. There were many grieving relatives and they wanted to speak to their dead loved ones. In November 1941, Helen held a seance in Portsmouth. During her performance, she claimed the spirit of a sailor was speaking to her. It told her that a British battleship, the HMS Barham, had been sunk. The Navy eventually became interested and wanted to know how Helen knew about this event. The ship was indeed lost, but the government hadn't told the public yet. They would later learn the information had leaked. But in the meantime, the Navy sent officers to Helen's seances to learn more of her secrets. Two lieutenants were in Helen's audience in 1944. One of them wasn't impressed. A figure in white cloth appeared, claiming to be his deceased aunt. The officer didn't have a dead aunt. Later, another figure emerged and claimed to be his sister, but the lieutenant's sister was alive and well. The naval officer was disgusted by Helen. He went to the police and told them what happened. The police then attended one of Helen's seances. They arrested her as she appeared beneath a sheet, pretending to be a spirit. The Last Seance Authorities were not sure what to do with Helen Duncan. They wanted to punish her for preying upon the grief of others, but it wasn't clear what legal remedies were available. Magistrates were delighted when they discovered Section 4 of the Witchcraft Act of 1735, Fraudulent spiritual activity was a crime. They could use this to bring her in front of a jury. Two other spiritualists were also prosecuted under this law at the same time. The police did not collect any physical evidence when Helen was arrested, so the government could not prove that she was fraudulently taking money from those who attended her seances. But they were able to obtain a conviction for her violation of the Witchcraft Act, Helen was convicted. The court sentenced her to a nine-month prison term. Helen cried out, I've done nothing. Is there a god? She was the last woman imprisoned for violating the Witchcraft Act. In 1951, that act was repealed by the Fraudulent Mediums Act. Spiritualists who claimed to speak to the dead and took money for it could finally be prosecuted. After her release, Helen claimed that she would no longer hold seances. But in 1956, authorities discovered that she was holding them in Nottingham and taking money from those who attended. Helen was arrested again. Even with a new law on their side, the authorities were unable to prove their case against her. In December of that same year, Helen Duncan passed away. She is sometimes remembered today as... The Last Witch.
Was she just providing harmless entertainment, or was the English government right to convict her of witchcraft? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button for us. Subscribe to our channel if you want to learn more obscure things in the future. We also have a Patreon page, and there is merchandise on the website as well. Links are in the video description if you're interested. We can't speak to the dead, but maybe if you keep watching, we'll stay alive a little bit longer. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.